Happy Monday. I hope you all had a good weekend and are ready to engage and hear from our speaker today. We actually do not have any campus announcements, so we will get straight to our speaker so we have the time for the presentation and then for a Q&A time afterwards. Introducing our speaker this morning is Professor, Professor Rachel F. Fuller. I'll invite her up. Good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure today to introduce Dr. Rachel Waltner Gosen, our convocation speaker and our featured speaker for this year's Menno Simons Lecture Series. Dr. Gosen graduated from Bethel with a degree in history. She went on to earn a master's degree in history from the University of California at Santa Barbara, a PhD from the University of Kansas, and she's now professor of history at Washburn University in Topeka. I had the pleasure of working with her last year uh, to help plan a conference at Eastern Mennonite Uni University called Crossing the Line, Women of Anabaptist Traditions Encounter Borders and Boundaries. This project was only one example of the ways in which she has mentored and encouraged both students and colleagues to seek out diverse voices when writing and speaking about history, most recently in urging us to join the Women Also Know History online database project. Dr. Gosen is the author of the book Women Against the Good War, Conscientious Objection and Gender on the Home Front, 1941 to 47, co-author with the late Robert Kreider of When Good People Quarrel, Studies of Conflict Resolution, and in the past few years, she has published several articles on issues of sexuality and sexual abuse in the Mennonite Church. Her talk this morning is entitled, Coming Out, Mennonite Leaders Arriving. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Rachel Waltner Gosen. Thank you so much, Rachel. And thank you everybody for coming out this morning. I am just so happy to be back on the Bethel campus, and I've been looking forward to sharing with you some of the research that I've been doing over the past two years, learning about people in Mennonite faith traditions who have felt a call to ministry uh, and are also identify as LGBTQ. My intention this morning during Convo is to share what I've been learning and to show some illustrations here on the screen and we'll be doing that for about half an hour, and then I want to leave plenty of time for questions and for your responses and comments. So please be thinking about how you want to join in the discussion. Over the past few years, advocacy for LGBTQ persons has been on the upswing at Bethel and on many campuses. This college's website has included a diversity and inclusion statement with the following invitation. Be part of a community that reflects a range of racial, cultural, and ethnic traditions. Value the richness and learning that comes from a rich mix of individual differences, including dimensions of age, culture, educa education, ethnicity, exceptionalities, gender, geographical origin, language, politics, race, religion, sexual orientation, and socioeconomic status. Students here can opt to join the Gay Straight Alliance devoted to advocacy and sharing resources. This is a significant development on campus and so is the celebration of Pride and Inclusion Week here at Bethel each spring. Yesterday, I gave a sermon at Bethel College Mennonite Church, in which I spoke of the experiences of Anita Fast, a Goshen College graduate and formerly a volunteer with Christian peacemaker teams who served at Hebron in the West Bank. <clears throat> she works as the registrar at Vancouver School of Theology, where she completed her master's degree in 1999. By that time, she had been out in terms of her sexual identity for a very long time. She titled her master's thesis, Called to be Queer. Like any good wordsmith adept at language and the double entendre, she was invoking the term called in a provocative way. As the literary scholar Daniel Shank Cruz points out, quote, the notion of being called to a specific vocation is a significant one in the Mennonite theological tradition. 
Whether this call comes directly from God or whether it comes from someone else in the faith community, narratives of call are a common trope and have permeated North American Mennonitism in official and unofficial ways." End quote. Anita's play on words, called to be queer, asserts her sexual identity. And at the time of her theological studies back in the 1990s, you know, two decades ago, she explored what it meant to be called to ministry. But as a person who identified as queer, was she called by Mennonite church bodies to exercise leadership? No. She may well have pursued pastoral ministry back in the 1990s had it been available to her. Now, 20 years later, she enjoys preaching at the Mennonite congregation where she's been an active lay leader for more than a decade and in other venues where she's welcomed to the pulpit. But it's not her day job. During our interview, I asked if she expects people of a younger generation, people now in their teens and 20s, to successfully pursue calls to ministerial leadership. Yes, she says, colleges are coming out with supportive statements and once the doors open, people will feel there's a place for them. She has a message for straight allies as well as people who identify as queer. She says to the allies, thanks for the work you're doing. It's gonna be allies that need to step up because we LGBTQ Christians are a pretty small and tired community. So the more folks that are willing to take risks, that will bring about change. Over the past two years, I've interviewed 27 LGBTQ persons across the US and Canada. Every one of them is theologically trained from a variety of graduate schools and with an array of masters and in some cases, doctoral degrees. I want to be clear that throughout this convocation and this entire Menno Simons lecture series, when I convey names and biographical information, these individuals have given me permission to do so. In addition, several persons were willing to share their stories but not at least yet to be identified publicly because they are not fully out in all settings. Further, there are undoubtedly theologically trained Mennonites who did not come to my attention or maybe are questioning their sexuality that just did not come to my attention while I was researching. And I also want to acknowledge that people of color are underrepresented in this study of queer Mennonites. The definition of leadership that I've utilized, that is pastors, chaplains, theologians, church administrators, assumes a narrower scope than definitions that recognize that people of color have often uh, in the past and continue now to exercise leadership through many other channels. That is in part due to their having had less institutional power than white Mennonites have had over time and across church agencies. All of this is to say that there's still room for more study, significantly more study, and I'd be happy for any of you who have suggestions of people who I should engage with to talk to me after Convo with your ideas for my further broadening and deepening this work. The faith leaders we'll be considering this morning are a varied group of adults of all ages and wide ranging experiences, both religiously and in terms of their sexual identities and gender identities. For some, their faith commitments have shifted markedly over the course of their own lives. One of my interviewees, for example, who was raised Mennonite and earned a graduate degree in peace studies, no longer claims Christian identity or faith but nearly all the others do profess Christian as well as more specific Anabaptist or Mennonite affiliations. In terms of sexual identities, for some, this has changed over their life course. While many of my interviewees recognize themselves as having non-hetero identities from an early age, at least a few of them uh, assumed themselves to be heterosexual well into adulthood and then eventually came to replace that identity with something else lesbian or gay or bisexual or queer. 
As for the term LGBTQ used as a catch-all phrase for sexual minorities, among the 27 persons I interviewed, only one identified as T, transgender. Lifting up these faith leaders' experiences is a specific strategy that I'm utilizing here as a historian. Since their narratives have generally not been recorded and their pain has rarely been acknowledged by church-related institutions. Part of my aim is to highlight these narratives of individual Mennonite leaders, most of whom are not widely known and have been marginalized within church structures. Further, through the narratives shared here in these leaders' own words, we begin to see how experiences with historic marginalization has moved people to act. Some departed church institutions. Others arrived to engage with collective church bodies in Mennonite contexts. In these individual actions, we see that the church as a corporate body is not fixed or unmovable, but changeable. Church bodies, collectives, sometimes are transformed and channeled into new directions. Both this morning as we examine the stories of queer individuals who have arrived into Mennonite circles and are providing leadership, and in this evening's lecture tonight at 7 o'clock when we consider some reconcilia reconciliation stories of Mennonite ministers being expelled years ago and then circling back years later and now being embraced, we'll see possibilities of individuals influencing structures, even transforming them into more hospitable spaces. Last evening, I focused on individuals who were compelled to leave Mennonite ministerial positions, in some cases more than 20 years ago, because of their sexual identities. And I also spoke about those who have migrated out of Mennonite denominational structures voluntarily because they wanted to pursue ministry in environments that are very welcoming to LGBTQ individuals, including people in leadership. This morning, our focus is not on people departing Mennonite circles, but rather leaders arriving and choosing to stay Mennonite despite continued challenges. Several of these are still navigating their way into ministry in Mennonite settings. They're young adults who have encountered Anabaptist theology through seminary studies or other venues, and they've concluded that this faith and forms of Mennonite community resonate with them. But as they negotiate professional positions in Mennonite institutions, trying to find pastorates or pursue licensing, they've been bumping into conflicts in the Mennonite church over LGBTQ inclusion. One of these is someone who, as a college student, began to sense a strong call to ministry. At that time, she was coming from a fairly conservative religious background. Beginning at a young age, she had felt attracted to both men and women, but had tamped down thoughts of being bisexual. Her pastor, during her college years, helped her to move away from a love the sin or hate the sin mentality. She began to hear and internalize the message that if you include and accept people, you also accept their gifts, right? Gradually, she came to a conviction that LGBTQ folks inclined to leadership can and should exercise their gifts in church settings and beyond. She's now a pastor, and she is Latina. She says that navigating identities within her congregation can be challenging. People are generally supportive, but she's noticed that they are more likely to articulate their welcome to her as a Latina in a predominantly Anglo denomination than to acknowledge her LGBTQ identity. For some of these Mennonite leaders, their challenges began in seminary or in voluntary service. In 2011, Caitlin Desjardins, a Wheaton College graduate was a 22-year-old seminary student who lived in a Mennonite voluntary service house in Elkhart, Indiana. Her identity as a lesbian so offended a conservative Mennonite person who'd been 
newly assigned to join the small group unit at the Elkhart House, that letters soon arrived on the desks of officials at MVS, Mennonite Voluntary Service, Mennonite Mission Network, and Mennonite Church USA, the denominational offices. Yet another letter went to Prairie Street Mennonite Church in Elkhart, where Caitlin would soon begin an internship. These were letters that named her as an abomination. The anxiety that followed this trauma permeated her seminary-related experiences through to her graduation in 2013. Now, a half decade later, she suggests wryly that we'll start to figure out some slightly better practices when we start to talk about how the institution functions and its violence. I think that might take another generation. Now living in Cincinnati, she recently became the third openly queer Mennonite licensed by a district conference of Mennonite Church USA, and she serves as a chaplain at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center. Erica Lee Simke, whose upbringing was Baptist and who graduated from Truett Seminary at Baylor in Texas in 2014, had her beginnings among Mennonites as an interim pastor at the Houston Mennonite Church. In an introductory sermon to that congregation that she titled, This Is My Story, she reflected, I knew that God knew me and that God called me, but I did not see how it was possible to continue to step forward as a minister because I recognize that I'm gay. It was not safe until I believe now to share. Thank you. This is one of the many reasons why I'm so excited to be with you these next few months. Among the Mennonites I have met, I'm learning a new way of Christian faith, one that celebrates differences, is actively engaged in peacemaking, and a community that desires to live radical hospitality. Honey, I'm home. She says of her arrival among progressive Mennonites, quote, these are my people, this is my tribe, these are the things I've believed for a long time. She is the first solo pastor to be called to Mennonite Church USA congregation at Albuquerque, New Mexico, and now a year into her pastorate there, she's preparing to be licensed with Mountain States Mennonite Conference. Another Mountain States Mennonite Conference story. Randy Spaulding has had a long career as a Mennonite minister, musician, songwriter, and compiler of some of the hymnals used by congregations throughout the US and Canada. But when he came out as gay in 2009 in mid-career, Mennonite Church USA forced him off the bi-national hymn book committee he was chairing. He describes that as a painful process, essentially excommunication. He then left the Mennonites for a time, completed a Master of Divinity degree at Yale, became affiliated with the Unitarian Universalists, and served as an oncology chaplain in New Haven. But in an interesting twist, last year he was called to be the new pastor of Boulder Mennonite Church in Colorado. He remains credentialed with the Unitarian Universalists. Meanwhile, his installation service and celebration at Boulder Mennonite took place this past February, and he's been licensed with the Mountain States Mennonite Conference. Randy is looking forward to ordination to ministry this winter. Of his journey, he recounts, quote, back in the late 1980s, I got married because I thought this is how God will heal me. A year into marriage, I had a kind of breakdown and talked with my wife about things that had happened, what I was dealing with, and then found a counselor doing reparative therapy. That was a total disaster. My former wife is straight. She's an advocate for queer rights. We divorced in 2006 after 18 years of marriage. 
Also, my mother has been a supporter. I waited to age 40 to come out. But not everyone has had the same response. I have one conservative brother who will step out of family group photos if my husband gets in the group picture. About his recent move to Colorado, Randy says that serving a Mennonite congregation is not going back. That's not what this is, he says. People have said to me recently in coming to Boulder, glad you're back. But I have responded that I am still part of the Unitarian Universalist faith while serving a Mennonite congregation. I'm moving forward, not back. Michelle Burkholder grew up in Harrisonburg, Virginia, the daughter of a Mennonite minister. From a very early age, she recalls, I knew my gender identity was fluid. I was more masculine. Even in my preschool years, I played with trucks and cars and wanted to roughhouse. My older sisters played with other things and I was different from them. My mom always said I was born with the wrong plumbing. And now looking back, I see my mom had a good understanding. At the age of 21, when Michelle came out as queer, she had the full support of her parents. Her dad was serving as minister for Virginia Mennonite Conference at the time. And she remembers he chose to love me. He and my mom had long known this moment was coming. My dad chose to be supportive of me and love me. But he also had to do his job to deal with people all over the spectrum of how people in the church think about queer people. Her journey since then has included a commitment ceremony, legal marriage, and having a child who's now a preschooler. Last year, Michelle was licensed to ministry at Hyattsville Mennonite Church in Maryland, which has had a long history of being disciplined by its regional conference, Allegheny Mennonite. Allegheny Mennonite Conference has experienced a number of congregations recently pulling out of that conference. As of this year, they're down to just 12 remaining congregations, down from 37 congregations. Uh, more conservative congregations have been pulling out. Of her licensing to ministry, Last year, Michelle says, quote, it was joyful, phenomenal, a celebration, lovely for me personally. But beyond that, it was the first time in more than 10 years that Allegheny Conference was stepping up and supporting the work that Hyattsville was doing. It was amazing. Michelle adds, a few years ago, I recall discouraging someone who wondered if a queer couple should come into the Mennonite church. They were seeking a place and to do ministry, and I said, no. Not unless you want to deal with all the politics. This is not a good place to come. I think I would answer differently now. It's not easy or subtle, but it's changing. Jason Fry, who graduated from Bluffton College in 2010, was deeply involved in religious studies through his major campus chapel ministry, music and drama, and he participated in the ministry inquiry program. He also came out as gay during his college years. As an intern at First Mennonite Church in Bluffton, Ohio, he told a pastor in the Central District Conference that, quote, I was feeling called to a place that didn't exist yet. Doors were opening, I was having a lot of intense experiences, and there was a feeling I would keep moving on. Jason did go on to complete a Master of Divinity degree from Princeton and has since kept up many Mennonite ties. He participated in the most recent MCUSA conference last year in Orlando, and he is currently working on his doctorate in ethics at Chicago Theological Seminary. He says, Mennonites I have known still have a desire to come back and connect back even as they have found sanctuary in non-Mennonite spaces, adding, quote, a gift of a lot of LGBT Mennonites is that we struggle with the question of what it means to be Mennonite, whereas straight Mennonites may not. This idea that being marginalized prompts people to think hard about the central tenets of faith-based institutions, 
and of Mennonite communities in particular rings true for a number of the individuals I interviewed. Some congregations, educational institutions, and other spaces across Mennonite and Anabaptist faith communities encourage question, questioning of faith traditions and practices and embrace a spectrum of spiritual belief and religious commitment. Other Mennonite institutions, of course, are far less open to questioning. A few months after I interviewed Jason, he provided an update. Recently, he joined a United Church of Christ congregation, and he'll begin his ordination process this coming year. He is cautiously hopeful about the future of inclusion in the Mennonite church, calling himself an ecumenical Mennonite who engages other faith traditions. The Mennonites, he says, are becoming more welcoming, but those changes are coming too late for me. Here is another photo of Anita Fast on the left, who I referenced earlier, the woman from British Columbia, shown here with her girlfriend this past spring. This three-day pilgrimage that they're on was to the ruins of St. Mary's Indian Residential School, a grim place through much of the 20th century where First Nation indigenous children were forcibly taken and abused under the guise of so-called education. In a sermon that she preached several weeks after this pilgrimage, Anita lamented how Christians have so often wrongly, quote, encouraged people to bear their cross of suffering, thereby passively enduring illness or personal tragedy, or more maliciously, abuse from a spouse or the suppression of one same-sex attraction and longing for love. She continues, not once in the Gospels does Jesus tell someone who is suffering illness or injustice that this is their cross to bear. No, always he heals, frees, encourages, saves. Clearly, for queer Mennonites, there are now more opportunities for public theological reflection and for exercising leadership in congregations and in church institutions than was the case a decade or more ago. How swift has this rate of change been? One retirement age Mennonite leader who has been a strong ally for his LGBTQ colleagues says, quote, it feels like a snail's pace to queer folks and an Indy 500 style race to others. The rate of inclusivity is definitely moving. He adds, I can only admire the tenacity of those individuals who continue to pursue engagement with the church. These oral histories of more than two dozen theologically trained Mennonites help us to see broader patterns emerging of faith leaders who identify as sexual minorities. While there is a tension here between the individual's experiences and the historic stance of Mennonite institutions and agencies to be exclusionary, we can begin to draw at least three conclusions all of which we can explore more fully through your comments and questions yet this morning. First, LGBTQ leaders and many others are encouraged by the recent hiring, licensing, and ordination to ministry of queer candidates from the Rocky Mountains to the Atlantic coast. The pace of change toward progressive policies within Mennonite institutions ranging from colleges to conferences has quickened over the past decade. Second, Allies are warmly encouraged to step up and advocate for the well-being of all in Mennonite settings, including those who have been historically excluded from leadership as pastors, theologians, chaplains, church administrators, and in other capacities. And third, navigating identities for queer leaders remains challenging due to the pain of exclusionary violence in the past. Still, many people who have arrived at Mennonite identity and affiliations choose to stay engaged in the church, seeing potential for transformation and contributing along the way for, to the restructuring of power and privilege across institutions. One of the persons I interviewed is not a Mennonite pastor, but a leader from another Anabaptist tradition, the Church of the Brethren. 
Carol Wise, who lives in Minneapolis, Minnesota, is director of the Brethren Mennonite Council for LGBT Interest, an organization that's been pushing for inclusion and justice for more than 40 years. In her interview with me, Carol asserted, we belong, that's our posture. In my mind, though, that's not the end. We need to keep moving. What kind of institutions can we build that are more humane for everyone? How do the dynamics of power and oppression and privilege and all those identities interact? That's what I keep moving toward, she added. Because if all we aim for is a few LGBT clergy, then we've really missed it. The really important function that remains is the critical function, that suspicion of hermeneutics. Who's heard and who's not heard? I'll end there with that challenge to keep this conversation going on college campuses like Bethel and wherever leaders are called and however they're called, queer, straight, authentic in their expression of self and in their engagement with those around them. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming. I didn't necessarily have a question or a comment for you, but somebody left their phone in the bathroom. It, that's a great case. I, I have it, so. Thank you. Thank you for being here today. Um, oh, hi. <laughs> hey. Uh, so I was wondering, uh, so you said you gave this presentation at BCMC? Uh, a sermon about Yes, I gave fast? a sermon yesterday morning. I did. Okay, so would you like be able to give the same presentation that you gave to us at Heston or? Yes. Or like, is there any Mennonite institutions that will reject this presentation? Okay, yeah, I see where you're coming from. That, or in other in words, churches? is this a more a more uh, receptive yeah, cause institution? Like, it makes sense for you to give a presentation like this here at Bethel because, mm -hmm. you know, everybody's pretty open-minded, but mm -hmm. what about, you know, like uh, Goshen yeah. or Bluffton? Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you so much for asking that. I wondered that myself, because <laughs> uh, Bethel was the first place to invite me. So uh, um, I, I think that the institutions that you mentioned, you talked about Heston, Bluffton, and Goshen. Um, if they invite me, I would just clear my schedule completely to get right there and give these presentations. And I think that I would be received um, probably with some mixed reception, but also with a lot of engagement, and I would really welcome that. There are more conservative institutions, though, than the ones that you mentioned, and I think there would be some places where this, this message would not be as welcome. So thanks so much for that. Um, what made you decide to pursue this research? Yeah. Um, I began working in, in uh, 2014, four years ago, on a completely different uh, historical project, and it was actually on, kind of on behalf of Mennonite Church USA denomination to look at how in the 1970s and 80s and 90s, Mennonite institutions had dealt with issues of sexual abuse and sexual harassment and specifically, my task there was to look at um, the sexual abuse of a very prominent Mennonite theologian at that time, John Howard Yoder, who was a serial abuser of adult women. And that pulled me into looking at uh, women's experiences, especially in what I consider to be a fairly patriarchal uh, Christian faith tradition, the Mennonites, of which I'm part and parcel. And I realized through doing that project that at places like seminaries, um, certainly at the seminary at Elkhart, Indiana, where Yoder was a longtime uh, professor, he'd even been president uh, of the seminary for a time, uh, there were a number of women who felt called to ministry, but they got to places like that seminary and they, they, they chose not to pursue those vocations of ministry or to be missionaries or to go into uh, church service because the, the institutions at that time, and I'm talking a generation or a generation and a half ago, were, were really quite hostile to women. 
and um, as a feminist that uh, really impacted me in what I was thinking about and also as a Mennonite who is part of a church and um, Mennonite Church USA institutions I started making the connection in my own mind that, wow, a generation or so women were being pushed out of leadership possibilities even though they felt called to those things. And I knew just from reading the papers even that LGBTQ people in the Mennonite church also are not welcome in so many spaces. And I thought, I have to connect this. Like I have to find out, like I've just been spending all this time learning about women in the past who felt called to ministry. How about um, queer leaders now, especially maybe younger leaders, what's their experience? And so I felt motivated to look into this. So that's what drew me in. Hi. Hi. Uh, thanks so much for speaking. That was really interesting to me. Um, and I had a question about maybe um, your next steps in this research. Um, <laughs> Your presentation today was mostly over the Mennonite Church USA denomination. I was wondering if you uh, planned on looking into the Mennonite Brethren uh, denomination or other more conservative branches of Mennonite mm -hmm. um, and then institutions like uh, Tabor College or um, other Mennonite Brethren colleges maybe looking at um, how they're approaching uh, this topic like um, you know, Bethel has been fairly um, accepting and open-minded about this topic and how other colleges are shifting. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Um, when I started this study, I decided to try to interview anybody that considered themselves to be Anabaptist or Mennonite from any branch. So actually, Mennonite brethren people, um, you know, there may be one or two even represented in, in my own study already, but I wasn't, I wasn't trying to just look at specific denominations. And so I also um, interviewed somebody, he wasn't represented in my pictures here, but somebody who graduated like from Rosedale Bible College in Ohio, which is a very conservative Mennonite institution, and he's a, he's a gay man uh, who would felt called to ministry. So I've tried to take any comers who would be willing to speak to me if they identify as Anabaptist from, you know, whatever background that is, and so that's been my approach. And I'm gonna continue to do that, but I think as I continue to find people to interview, I'm also, as I mentioned in the talk, not gonna be quite so um, specific that they have to be theologically trained because I, several people who have read my um, drafts of my presentations before coming here have said, you know, um, there's so many other kinds of leaders than the ones that have had the, the privilege and the opportunity to go to seminaries, and why don't we look more broadly at leadership? And so that's actually, ra maybe rather than looking at a lot of different specific colleges policies, I'm probably not gonna do that, but I will look more broadly at leaders. And I, to the extent I can lift up and amplify the voices of queer leaders so people who are either reading my work or hearing my presentations can hear them in their own voices, that's, that's actually the, the root and the heart of, of what I wanna be doing going ahead. And um, I'm also really very happy that Bethel College um, has agreed to make my lectures here um, available online. So they're, they're doing video recording. And so this week, as I understand it, there's gonna be a link on the Bethel website so that anybody around the world who's interested in this can access my talks, uh, including yesterday's talks and, and uh, today and tonight as well so that the information can go out. And of course, uh, I'm trying to be invitational that this work is not done, so if people have folks that I, they think I should be trying to interview, um, I'm taking notes about that as well. Hi, thanks for speaking today. Um, you kind of glorified our institution a little bit at the beginning of the um, presentation, I was wondering if you had any critiques or things that we could do better or things you've seen other institutions do that um, are advocating for LGBTQ rights. Okay, I, yeah, in terms of glorifying, do you mean just the statement at the, on the front slide or? <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I guess it would be really great for me to, to meet um, at lunchtime or, or this afternoon with some Bethel students to actually know really directly what's going on here 
and what are the critiques that people right here have of the institution right now, and then, then I could be a little more helpful, I think, because I, it's, it, I mean, even though I bop in and out of, you know, North Newton from time to time, I'm not, I don't know exactly what's happening with allies and, and queer folk here at the moment. Um, there are, there are campuses, I know, uh, liberal arts colleges in the United States that are very upfront in their um, information, for example, to prospective students, that it is an open, welcoming campus, and that there are also classes that people can take, uh, either on queer theology um, or some kind of queer studies, and that, um, that those resources are available and completely embraced by the institution and not kind of as an afterthought, but they're built and woven into the fabric. Um, and I, I mean, one campus I know that does that is McAllister College in St. Paul, Minnesota. So you might want to just look at some of their online things as, as an example. Um, I think, in, uh, you know, colleges get rated for various things, but I think McAllister has been rated top in the nation for being um, very at the, f at the forefront of LGBTQ um, embrace of students. So, yeah, thanks. Hi, um, this has been a really fantastic presentation uh, and it was super well done. Thank you. Um, thank you for coming. Um, so you've been experienced or you've been interviewing these people about something that's probably been the most like tumultuous and traumatizing experiences that they've gone through. Mm -hmm. um, so aside from the idea that the church is slowly but steady changing, has there been any like overarching themes of like hope or um, how they got over this adversity that they personally found to help them like get through that experience? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's, that's, I'm thinking about a couple different ways I can answer that. Um, some of you might have been here last night at my lecture when I mentioned that of the people that I interviewed, about a quarter of them told me in the interviews that either as um, teenagers or as young adults or even a little bit later, in some cases middle-aged, they went through uh, very pretty terrible experiences of depression. Um, and uh, a quarter of them mentioned um, thinking about suicide and they also made it clear that when they had those struggles, they were you know, thinking about what would it mean to come out and how would their family respond, how would their church respond, how would their circles of people respond. They said that those were not things that got resolved easily or quickly, like in some cases it was like years of struggle. Um, and so they, when, when they came out and then experienced the, the freedom that that represented for them, um, they have been very, very, very motivated to serve as leaders in churches and places where they can engage um, young queer folk, especially LGBT children. Um, and one of the statistics I read in, in preparing uh, for these lectures is that the, the age of coming out now, it's been dropping where people come out, the average age is now age 13. That was not true for so many, you know, you saw on, on my screen here some older adults, you know, when they came out, they were coming out as adults, not, and so they, so almost all these people talk to me about the responsibility that they feel for, for young people, that, that the young people not have to go through what they had to go through. And so they feel actually hopeful because um, I think I could, that there is more societal acceptance now in the in this part of the 21st century than there was, um, and it's because of changes even um, you know in our political uh, system and with um, you know gay marriage or, or same sex marriage now being legal um, in Canada that's been true for now going on two decades in this country you know it's since 2014 or 2015, and so all of those societal changes they see as extremely hopeful. Um, because it means that there's much broader acceptance. So one of my motivations with these lectures is I feel the church is lagging behind the society. 
and that bug, bugs me. <laughs> and so, I mean, I think the church should lead, not, you know, follow, right? I mean, and that, that's something that people said in the civil rights movement to, um, you know, where's the Mennonite church in the civil rights movement in the 50s and 60s? So it's not, it's not a new critique I'm making now, but, um, but maybe that answers part of it. And let's talk later, too, because I was thinking about other ways to respond to you as well, but they've gone out of my head. Could you give us brief details about your lecture? You have a lecture tonight as mm -hmm. well. Could you give details to uh, the audience just as a reminder? Uh, sure, yeah. Tonight at 7 o'clock I'm going to speak, uh, and I will again be showing um, some photographs. The talk tonight is, is going to have uh, a little different focus in that I discovered in my uh, interviewing people two individuals who were expelled from their uh, Mennonite institutions years ago, a uh, long time ago, because they came out as queer. And then they left the Mennonite institutions and were not part of that for a, quite a long time. But more recently, um, especially in those particular settings, the people around them have changed and have become much more welcoming of Mennonite leaders in Mennonite spaces. And these are individuals who are now coming back and ex exerting leadership in the very, the very spaces that they were expelled from years ago. And it's real, those are really quite remarkable reconciliation stories. So I'm gonna tell those two stories. And then um, in part of the lecture, I also wanna address um, what's going on, not just with North American context, but of course, um, people being LGBTQ, that's a worldwide thing, right? So it's not just limited to these Americans and Canadians that I've been talking to, but when we think about Mennonite Central Committee uh, and what their policies are as, as people are, are around the world, um, and in MCC, it's really quite exclusionary now how queer folks are, um, are treated by that agency. Also, Mennonite World Conference is a consortium of lots of different Anabaptists around the world including many in the Global South. So I wanna make some remarks about that tonight. So that, that'll be the focus. Yeah, thanks. Could we get one round of applause for us for you today? Tonight to engage 